There's so many small companies, but not enough big ones. And so as companies get bigger, they become rare really fast. And then the bigger capital players swoop in and they're fighting each other and they have to pay a higher price in order to get fewer assets that actually come up to the size level that they want to play. So in my real life example, we buy them for five times, we sold them for 14 times. You're talking about a $414 million profit just from arbitrage, just from buying those 23 companies. Welcome to episode number three. Can you make nine figure doing this? Welcome to our show. Subscribe, share, because this might be a little bit controversial here today as Adam and I went viral or Adam. I just happened to be in the frame as well. In case you're tuning in the first time, Adam Coffee, 2.46 billion in exits, 58 company acquisitions, We've got about $3 billion coming sometime next year. JT Fox here, over 70 companies and brands, 55 countries. And this show is figuring, talk about, can we make nine figure doing this type of things? The roll-ups, buying companies or buying companies under your company, scaling them up. Adam, welcome back to the show. How are you? Hey, it's good to see you. 6 a.m., the drapes are down, but JT and I are rocking the house. The funny thing is the only time we can really do this show is at 6 o'clock in the morning, but both of us. Our schedule is, is kind of crazy. We'll talk about how we both spend most of our time as well. But before we do this, so we had a clip, episode number two, which I strongly recommend you guys should go back and listen to, where Adam talked about what is a roll-up. For example, the idea is how do you put companies together for $4 million, sell it for thirty-two, and vice versa, how do you put companies together and sell it for $10 million? And the clip went viral on my social media, but a couple of people out there taking that clip and saying, Adam is BS, or this is a BS strategy, it's not as easy. Let's play that clip. And you guys be the judge, and we'll let Adam from his mouth directly uh, see it. So let's play that clip. Let's just do some quick math. If I bought four companies, and each company had a million dollars in EBITDA, in earnings, and I put them together, let's say I pay five times for each of those companies. So one million in earnings, five times the multiple I pay, you know, I buy four of them. So four times five is 20 million. So I spend 20 million. I immediately turn around and I put them together. I work with them for six months. I get them growing a little bit. And instead of selling 4 million of EBITDA, I sell 5 million times eight. That's 40 million. I get a $40 million headline enterprise price. It costs me 20 million to buy it. I put 20 million in my pocket. I could do that all day long in under two years. Give me a year year to put the four companies together, a year to work with them, exit. In under two years, that's a $20 million exit. All right, Mr. Chairman, Adam, you went viral on this clip as well. So what do you have to say to the people in the comments? It, it doesn't work. It's not true. It's too good to be true. I mean, the comments were just, were just brutal, probably from none of the people who's ever done this before. Explain this clip to the person. Well, when you have $2.4 in exits, like I do, then you can talk to me about what's real and what's not real. So, J JT, I, I have to tell you, you know, uh, private equity today is a six trillion. That's with a T. That's a lot of damn zeros. Six trillion dollar industry and arbitrage, which means the difference between what I sell for versus what I buy for, you know, is the number one way private equity makes the majority of its returns. You know, organic growth is great. We got to have that too. We got to have margin improvement. But the single largest driver of profitability in the world of private equity is arbitrage. So let me just make sure that I explain what the hell arbitrage is and why this works, you know, and, and why it's real. So it's not an Adam Coffee methodology. I've been in the industry for decades. I learned how to do this by working with private equity firms. Matter of fact, I worked with nine private equity firms. I built three empires using this methodology and I have two and a half billion dollars in exit. So I can tell you firsthand it works because I've lived it. So here's the basic construct, the basic way that it works. There are 33 million small companies just in the United States hundreds of millions globally, but just here in the US, 33 million small companies, not enough buyers, not even enough private equity buyers to buy all the companies that would like to sell. 
Matter of fact, the statistic is about 80% of companies that would like to sell, never sell, never find a buyer. People retire, they just shut them down. And so a lot, a lot of small companies. My last empire that I built, I bought 23 companies. I had a platform. So private equity firm buys a company, half debt, half equity. We then buy 23 additional companies. On average, I paid five times for each of these 23 companies. Now, as we put those companies together, lay them on top of the platform that we started with, we are doing what I call is climbing the private equity pyramid. So remember, 33 million small companies just in this country. There's only 3,000 companies on the entire planet that have a billion dollars in revenue. 2,000 are public, 1,000 are private. And so as companies get bigger, they become rare. You've got 8,000 PE firms with $6 trillion. All of them invest about 6 to 8% of their fund in any one company. And that means that big guys like KKR, Blackstone, companies that you've heard with 10 to $30 billion funds, they have a 10-year fund life. They have the first five to six years to invest all their capital, and then they have to return all the capital within 10 years. Basically, what we're saying is big firms buy big companies. They have to. Somebody with a $10 billion fund, if they're buying small companies, it would take them like 50 years to put all that money to work. And they only have five to six years to make the investments, and they have to return all capital to shareholders in a 10-year period. So basically what happens is, there's so many small companies, but not enough big ones. And so as companies get bigger, they become rare really fast. And then the bigger capital players swoop in and they're fighting each other and they have to pay a higher price in order to get fewer assets that actually come up to the size level that they want to play. So in my example that I gave you, real life example, we buy them for five times we sold them for 14 times, which means for every $1 of profit or $1 of EBITDA that I bought and paid $5 for, once I put those companies together, I then turn around and sell that same dollar for 14. So 14 minus five equals $9 worth of arbitrage that the shareholders that I'm working with, we get to share. And in that specific math example, you're talking about a $414 million profit just from arbitrage, just from buying those 23 companies. Add on top of that organic growth, add on top of that margin improvement, and that is the formula for private equity success. So is it real? Hell yes, it's real. I've been living this for about the last 21 years as a CEO building three companies. I wrote three number one best-selling books on the topic, and I have two and a half billion dollars in exits. So to all the people out there who don't believe in arbitrage, well, they probably haven't lived it, JT. So their ignorance is their bliss. This is where we drop the mic, but... Um... Let's explain to people, some people don't understand if you're buying a company, let's say at a, at a five, uh, five times multiple, right? So I, I put these companies, why is it all of a sudden worth eight or more? It's just people don't, can't understand that, that I'm putting all these companies together at five. Now, why is it worth eight? Well, it's, it's, it's that rareness. It's that, it's that rareness that I'm talking about. And boy, if, if I can just throw up a little itty bitty uh, slide just to try to help further drive this point home. I'm going to do this. Let me find this slide real quick. You can and get... before, as Adam is finding this, if people just need to understand is that the difference between sort of venture funding is, let's say you invest in a hundred companies, you're basically putting chips on a roulette. Would that be a good assessment of what venture funding is? There's a hundred companies. I'm going to invest 25,000, 50,000, a hundred thousand. And I'm hoping that, you know, one or two will become a unicorn, which is rare. And I'm hoping some of them return a good return. Some of them, hopefully, I can just get my money back. And the rest, you're probably going to lose. Is that a fair assessment of venture funding? It, it, it is. V venture capitalists invest in ideas. You know, I, I've looked at a lot of uh, uh, prospectuses on, on VC funds, you know, and uh, I, I got to be honest with you, JT. 
vast majority of VC funds don't beat the S&P 500. It seems, though, from an investor perspective, it's the easiest segment for the common investor to find a, a, a means of investing in. The typical buyout fund, which is where the majority of private equity capital is located, these funds require a $5 million minimum investment, but I see VC funds all the time, small ones that take $25,000, $50,000 increments. And so a lot of people get excited because they can and, and actually the, invest and in them. the dream, right? You're like, this could be, That's it. the pitch is always, this could be the next Uber, this could be the next, you right. know, whatever, which by the way, for every one of these, based on the stats, most of them fail, which by the way, I think the VCs, the sophisticated one, know that it's a numbers game. Um, yeah. On this side, you're buying a company, a private equity is buying a proven company that is making money. Well, and, and it's more than that, JT. I talk about this in Empire Builder in, in my third book, you know, your favorite book, because the first line is just a jewel. But, you know, I, I, I'll tell you that, you know, it, it, inside that book, I also lay out the framework. So it's not just any company in any industry, when you put them together, it goes from call it a four or a five multiple up to an eight multiple. It's certain kinds of companies with certain profiles. So in that book, I talk about needs versus wants. We want to buy companies that focus on solving needs. Why? Because in a down economy, when the economy cycles and starts to go down, Companies that are focused on needs are more resilient than companies that are focused on wants. If I want something, but I'm unemployed, I don't make the spend. If I need something and I'm unemployed, I still have to make the spend. And so needs versus wants. I then talk about a lot in my, 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 uh, my books and my seminars you know, about the fact that contracted revenue versus project-based revenue, contracted revenue is more valuable. Then I talk about low capital expenditures so that we don't have to make a, a huge amount of investment. What we're really saying is I've got this regular income stream. You know, it's contracted. So every time I add a new customer, it adds on top of the old customers I already have rather than trying to replace it because it's a project based business. And, and then low capital expenditure, high free cash flow. These are the kinds of businesses that I'm targeting. A lot of these would be would be services businesses. So it could be professional services like accounting, bookkeeping. It could be like blue collar services like pest control. Think about pest control for a second. You know, I sign a contract. It never ends. Never ends. Every month, that pest control company hits my credit card for 70 bucks, 80 bucks, whatever the charge is. And then they come out once a quarter and they spray around my house. They're charging me every month but they come spray once every quarter. Then they tell me, hey, Adam, it's mosquito season. Would you like to get mosquito spray? That's a separate service, separate contract. I can add that on. Sure, love to have it. Hey, Adam, you know what? Summertime, we got these, these bugs here that kill your grass, you know, these, these special kind of worms, army, whatever the hell they're called. Hey, you want, you want to get treated for that? Yeah, sure, what the hell? Go ahead. You know, hey, Adam, we got a lot of termites. You know, you want a termite contract for your house? Yeah, sure, why not? Before you know it, I've got like four or five pest control different contracts from one provider who's hitting my credit card all the time, you know, and it's businesses like that or businesses like bookkeeping or accounting that are, you know, here's the product. It's in my head. I don't need a lot of capital expenditures. I don't even need the trucks that the pest control guys have to buy. Here's my product. It's right here. It's my knowledge. Professional service companies tend to have very, very high margins. So there's a certain profile, a certain kind of business that will get the arbitrage. And I've got that slide. So let me share this slide real quick. And I'll just show everybody how this works. And so what you're looking at is what I call the, 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 the private equity pyramid here. So I'm going to animate it so we can go through this. Okay. On this side of the pyramid, I've got 8,000 PE firms. At the top, Blackstone, Carlisle, KKR, all the big ones you hear about every day. And then there's 8,000 firms up and down. The biggest firms have funds that range in size from $10 billion to $30 billion in size. And then you go all the way down to small firms, mom and pop firms, family offices that may have $80 million or less you know, in their, in their funds. 
All of these funds last for 10 years. Everybody has to invest their money in the first five to six years if they're a traditional PE fund. And all of them are modeling about a three times multiple of invested capital as their returns. All of them invest about six to eight percent of their fund in any one company. And so because of this activity, you know, and the fact that they're all doing the same things, but they have different piles of capital, it creates five swimming lanes, I call them, of private equity. And essentially, how far it goes from the bottom to the top is about how long a company can be can be worked with by one private equity firm. They got about an average five-year hold period. And so someone that buys at 15 gets up to about 50, and then their time's up. They have to sell it. The next size firm swoops in, buys it, and in five years, they can take it from 50 to 100. Next guy comes in, et cetera. So keep in mind, again, as I said, 33 million small companies down here. There's only 8,000 private equity firms. They can't buy 33 million companies. You know, these companies are coming, they're going, people are retiring, they're dying, you know, and so you've got no rarity. There's no scarcity. I was just doing a, a search just for uh, for the chairman group for tomorrow night on pest control using Dun & Bradstreet Hoover's. You know, I identified like, uh, you know, 14,000 pest control companies just within like a hundred mile radius of, of Dallas, Fort Worth. And so it's like a bunch of small companies because there's so many of them, the purchase price, you know, stays small. So here's that five X. I bought 23 companies, my last empire, and I paid on average five times. Cheapest one, 3.8, most expensive one, about six and a half, but average five times. I put them together. I'm climbing the PE pyramid. And again, remember, 33 million companies down here, only 3,000 on the planet with a billion in revenue at the top. End result is, I call this a Velcro patch. You can take this patch off, put it in a shoebox, and I got a different patch for every industry. And this industry, you know, this particular patch, it's pretty generic and it works for a lot of industries, but it's not the, the, the be all for everything. And so when I put that patch up, it kind of shows me what small companies in an industry trade for and what larger companies in an industry trade for. So I buy 23 companies at 5X, I climb the PE pyramid, and then I sell it at 14X. And what am I rewarded with? I'm rare. I'm rare. There's fewer funds with the big funds, with the big dollars, and they're swimming around in here looking for stuff to buy. I create a meal. I serve it up to them. They pay what is called the, the, you know, the fair market value for those companies. And it's the arbitrage that creates the shareholder return. So what we're talking about, JT, is doing it on a small scale. And if I can buy companies for like, you know, if I could put four small companies together you know, with about a million dollars of EBITDA each, and I'm paying about four to five times for those, when I put them together, I'm creating the first meal for the real PE firms that want to buy in this space, you know, they come in at about 4 million of earnings and they buy. And that company, if it's that pest control company, that bookkeeping company, it's going to sell for about eight times. This is the math that you and I were talking about kind of on a small scale for smaller entrepreneurs. I've been doing it on a grand scale. You can do this on a small scale. I'm probably working with at least, I don't know, 15 to 20 people who are doing this actively right now you know and so also too some of the stuff that we're working on the companies that we are doing ourselves as well and by the way the whole point of this podcast is can we do it with you whether you're a person who has a company who would like to uh, you know uh, do this with us and we'll partner with you capital or connections or whichever there's a link in the youtube link um, or you want to be a deal maker and learn how to put this together use the same link as well but let's be clear on a scale of one to 10, 10 being hard, one being, sorry, 10 being super easy and, and one being very hard. How hard is to do this, would you say? Well, so if you have the knowledge, it's not hard. If you don't have the knowledge, it probably feels like world hunger. Um, you know, and, and so there's repetition, there's, you know, so I've been doing this for decades. You know, to me, it's simple, it's easy. Matter of fact, JT, I don't buy fixer upper companies. I only buy good companies 
because I let arbitrage that's naturally occurring in every industry, I let that create the return. And if I'm going to buy a bunch of companies and put them together, buying good ones makes it easier. Hard yeah, enough. Let's, let's, explain, let's explain this to some people. And that was my thing when I first started. I always thought, because I, I did over a thousand real estate deals, right? So I'm going to buy a distressed piece of property, fix it up, turning around. And after now working with you, us doing this very thing we're talking about, here you're like, JT, we don't buy bad companies and turn around. Explain why don't we buy? Because it's a psychological thing. Why would I buy a company at like, you know, that's doing very well, right? Which doesn't need to make, it doesn't seem like I'm going to get a good deal for it as opposed to buying a company that maybe they're all messed up and then I could turn around and then get higher. And so it was very shocking. You're like, you're like, it's better to pay market value for a very good company than buy a company that has great potential, but it's all messed up and has a lot of problems. Yeah. Let me tell you a real life story. So I, I uh, once upon a time, the same company as a part of these 23 companies that, that we were buying, you know, one, one of those was not a good acquisition. You know, it, it was trouble. And for less than 5% of my corporate revenue, it created about 80% of my headaches for about the next three years. And it felt like my entire leadership team every week, we're talking about this one company that was a disaster and how the hell are we going to fix it? And so I tell you, life is short because arbitrage is naturally occurring because this phenomenon of a lot at the bottom and very few at the top, and as companies get bigger, they're worth more, because that's occurring naturally, that is my return. It's already built in. So why the hell would I complicate my life? I'd rather spend more time hunting the next deal, the next deal, the next deal, rather than spend time getting bogged down inside a fixer-upper, I call it a dog with fleas, that I'm trying to fix. It's not a good use of my time to just try to go fix one little itty bitty company. If I just collect a bunch of good ones, pay fair market value, then as I get bigger, the naturally occurring arbitrage creates the return. So don't fix broken stuff. Leave that for some other donkey. You want to buy good companies, put them together, together with other good companies, and it makes it easier. It's hard enough to integrate. It's hard enough to get entrepreneurs who have never had a boss. I just gave them a wheelbarrow full of gold and now get them all to sing Kumbaya around the fire and stay motivated to want to go one more round with me. You know, it's that's that's hard enough. I call myself a den mother. You know, one, one of my skills is like I'm a Boy Scout den mother, you know, or a Girl Scout den mother trying to get all these people to work together now that I made them rich buying their company for the first time and telling them about the next payday, which will be bigger than the last, depending on the amount and percentage that they roll over, you know, and the returns that we get. And so, JT, life is hard enough. I don't need to complicate it. This isn't real estate. This is naturally occurring arbitrage. And I want to take advantage of that. And I want to do it fast as possible. So if I get bogged down for a couple of years with a bad company, I, I miss the opportunity to buy four or five companies during that time period and put them together. And so if I'm just collecting good companies, I can move faster. And I want to move faster to get to the exit so that I can go back down, and do it again. So the, the interesting part is, I, I'm just going to be clear. I don't think there's a, a, anything that's easy. Uh, I, I don't care what it is, I think. Um, and if it starts getting easier, as like Adam says, you've been doing a long time, but you always have to remember there's someone that is younger than you, hungrier than you, um, sometimes new capital, it's a bit more aggressive and you can get very complacent as well. But I think a lot of people they they get in they look at this and and interestingly the power of social media in a way is that the clip went viral. But if you think about it, that was a 38 minute interview that we did condensed in 45 seconds, and people took in that 45 seconds to judge that either this doesn't work, it's a scam, you know, for people who've never done it. And it was interesting too because there was a lot of comments. They're like, "Yeah, I'm in P roll up. This is how it works," and I think. On one hand, there's so much distrust on social media, what's posted, right? Um, because everyone is so much over-exaggerating, you know, their net worth or what is it they do. Um, and people don't take time to say, okay, this was a clip. What does it all say? And that's why we take things out of concept. And I think we're more focused on why things don't work 
to label them as scams to make it feel better about where we're not financially rather than saying, all right, let me break down. Or if you had just done basic due diligence on Adam, you'll realize he wrote three best-selling books on the topic. You know what I mean? For, forget his background that he did it, but he really wrote three best-selling books on the topic. And it, it's it's becoming a very interesting world, uh, Adam. But I think there's a level of mastery. You know, the, I'll tell you a little story. So there was a 21-year-old kid who comes on a random Zoom once in a while, once a month, I, I'll do a, a free Zoom and, and hear people out. And he comes up and he goes, I'm doing a, a um, I want to do a medical uh, roll up and uh, of, of companies, right, uh, of firms and, and, uh, you know, alternative health and kind of roll them up. And he says to me, I need $1.7 uh, million. So what, what do I want is like 10 year convertible. No. And, and a lot of it, what he was saying, he was like very well spoken, um, you know, had the terminology, but I suspect that there was a, it was a little green in something because it was a little bit basic. <clears throat> so then I ask him, like, how old is he? And he's, he has a beard and everything. He says he's 21. By the way, he looks like he's 30. So that to me was shocking. And then I said, okay, well, you know, what did you do before trying to do this? He goes, I was a broker. Well, how much did you make? 70,000. I said, okay, the odds that you are going to basically get people to and, and and what you know what was the red flag adam is he kept talking about his board my board my board my board and when people divert to their board right as a means of credibility the board is either someone that you paid to be on your board right and they're just kind of like pelicans and giving you advice here and there um or they're just they're getting shares in the company so of course they're going to tell us it's a good deal right and especially a board and like, I don't have a board. I have coaches that I pay, but I don't have a board. And you know, let me talk to my board. What well, you can't make decisions. Like, you know, this is not a publicly company. And, you know, he was very, you know, the odds of me giving someone $1.7 million, who's 21, who's never done a roll up like that, uh, unless I was personally involved. And unfortunately in this situation, I'd have to have final say because it's my money at risk. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and well, the fact that he's asking for 1.7 million to begin with means he's not recognizing your value isn't your wallet. Your value is well, what's I, I, yeah, but he didn't know. But then once I yeah. gave him the 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 opportunity, I said, you know what? Let me talk to Adam, right? Because Adam likes this space; he's the master of the roll up. See, we can do it together. And he goes, well, why would I come and spend the day and do this? I have access to a lot of nine figure people. And I said, then why aren't they giving you the money, right? And it was the ignorance of how much money are we willing to lose to gain the relationship? And at 21 year old, if this guy played the moves to be in a circle, like just being in the vicinity of me and you, right? I'd be like, at 21, you'd be like, whoa, this is the people that you're, he would have had credibility. And there's this naivete. Then he goes, you guys just want my deal. Like I have no shortage of deals. I mean, this podcast alone will generate hundreds of people that are gonna reach out, right? The last one, thousands of people, hey, want to do a roll up. Let's exit. We want an eight figure, nine figure exit. How do we do it with you? And I think the biggest mistake that people think is that you think that the most valuable commodity I have is my money. And it's really not. And, you know, even though I have a lot of it, Adam has a lot of it. It's my brain that made me the money. It's knowing what to do and what not to do. And giving money to someone who has never done it who is not willing to be coachable, is not willing to be handing, that means you're going to the casino with my money, right? And you haven't earned that money because you don't have $1.7 million. I do, right? And so the, there's a mindset shift as well. And it's, this is the difference is my first deal that makes money and then I'm branded forever because look, I'm a young guy. I did a deal. I did my first exit. I mean, even if you made the least amount of possible money where the investors made the most money, one successful exit can literally build a brand for the rest of his life, right? And so talk about that that case scenario, Adam, of, of what you see in the world. So it, 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 there's no shortage of people out there who are, are dreamers, JT. And you know, I, I, get, I get probably 100 inquiries a day where it's, hey, Adam, my idea plus your wallet equals success. And, and you know, it, it's like they're untested, they're unproven, and... If they could have someone like you and I riding shotgun with them, 
the probability of success goes up dramatically. And I, I would also tell you, just keep in mind that in a strong economy, I can make money doing damn near anything. It's when the economy goes south, which seems to happen a little bit more frequently, our cycles. It's like, that's where I need strategy and tactics. And I need the experience and knowledge to kind of weather the storm. And so it, it's, you know, I see it all the time. You know, it's, it, it's people who have, uh, I, I don't know if it's just giant egos, you know, that, that go with giant dreams, you know, big hat, no cattle is what we call it here in Texas. And, you know, they just don't understand that I'd rather, as, as we've said before, I'd rather own a share of a truck filled with watermelons, you know, than a hundred percent of one grape, you know, and, and it's learning how to, how to work with others. We need to, as entrepreneurs, we need to surround ourselves with experts, with people who've walked. Yeah, but people don't know the, the difference with an expert. Everybody's an expert on social media. That's the problem. And I think in a way, yeah. there's so much noise on there. I mean, there's someone who well, basically here, talks yeah, here, about- here, Here's what I know, JT, you know, for, for, the, for the doubters out there. Billionaires call me. Family offices call me. You know, and I'm doing roll-ups with a bunch of them. You know, and I'm doing everything that I talk about here- and, you know, as you know, I've had opportunities to go back another fourth run as a CEO and I've turned them down, you know, and are I, you happy I, you did it though? Looking back? I, I am. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I am. Oh, totally. It would have been a different lifestyle. Yeah. You, you know, it, it's okay. It's, it's okay. It's like, you know, I, I really decided for the next 10 years, you know, mm -hmm. which I'm calling the last 10 years of my career, I'm going to focus on trying to give back to the business community by teaching entrepreneurs at the lower levels of the pyramid how to be successful, how to use the tools that I learned through the schools of hard knocks and by working with some big firms, you know, over the decades, you know, I'm going to teach them how to be successful and I'm having fun, you know, so I'm getting well, a we, but also We're also doing it ourselves too. Like the, we do the yeah. deal. It's like, there's just to be clear. I mean, we, Right now in our pipeline, we have like 22 deals that we're currently working on. Just to put this into perspective, everywhere from Australia, I, I, company. I, I think that's one of the things that makes us a little different. You know, there's a lot of people out there who sell and their focus is I want to sell coaching. You know, I want to sell, you know, oh, I want to yeah. sell you into my ecosystem. Our focus is we want to do deals. Exactly. Deals. And, and, and But here's the thing, too. We want to take under the a look under the hood of you right? The way you are, how you interact, what type of you are, what's your philosophy, what's your culture? Because one of the mistakes that people sometimes is, is you're like, you want to do a roll up or you want to scale or you want to eight or nine figure exit. And all of a sudden, like you're, you're, the car is not like, call it a formula one. You're a Haas. You want to be a Red Bull, a Ferrari, right? But you're a Haas right now. And yes, you, you are successful and you are making money and you are in formula one but you're not winning, right? And so unfortunately, you either need the right team, right? That's that's the first thing, yeah. right? And maybe you need more capital, right? Because Red Bull and Ferrari are just so well financed. Like, so you need to figure out, do you want to be a Red Bull or Ferrari or do you want to be a Haas? You know? yeah. And there's nothing wrong with a, a Haas. A, a, yeah. JT, let me give you another example. I started working with a, an entrepreneur who owns a business. He had less than $2 million in earnings two years ago. You know, over the last couple of years, we've bought six companies. You know, we we now have around 12 million in EBITDA. We're selling for 160 million. When I met the guy two years ago, he his business was probably worth 15 million. Most people out there would say, hey, that's success. It is. But in less than two years, you know, we've added about 144 million in shareholder value, you know, to this guy's business by doing exactly the things that we're talking about here. You know, in two years, you know, to go from 15 million to 160, you know, that's a lot of jack. I mean, that, that, which, that, by the way, that there's, this show is called, can you make nine figure doing this? If there was one industry that you think that if you could either take a bunch of companies, put them together, or you were in this industry and you put companies underneath you to get it to a $10 million EBITDA for a nine figure exit. What would be the industry? If you had to just to pick one industry, what would that industry be? Well, so I, I probably would pick professional services. It's even cheaper capital expenditures than call it a, a home services type company. So bookkeeping, accounting, 
insurance agencies, independent wealth management, you know, but that usually requires, call it an entrepreneur with a higher, call it uh, IQ, you know, and, and a higher business acumen to play in those worlds. So if I wanted to go blue collar, you know, it, JT, it's, it's kind of funny. I hate to, I hate to go back to it, but you know, landscape maintenance, pest control, companies like that, that aren't very sexy. There's Plumbing, been electrical, there's been multiple billion dollar roll-ups, multi-billion dollar roll-ups done by private equity in these industries over the last decade. And they're still highly fragmented. They're still and, 40, and they're 50, buying 000. landscaping companies. Yeah. Billion dollar companies are buying landscaping companies. So that is just in itself to to don't discount. And the reason they're small is because they are landscapers trying to be entrepreneurs and it hit a scale where they either cannot invest more in trucks or more this, or they never got the acumen, right? And I'd be surprised how many people never got the acumen to put companies together to then put it on a roll up. Hey, um, yeah, yeah, just- I think your, your guy's a great proxy. So he's an expert at landscaping, right? He knows trees, he knows grass, he knows how to do what he does, but he's not a business guy, right? And so it's, it's, you know, so, so sometimes by partnering up, you know, an expert in their industry, an expert in their field, partnering up with people with business acumen can yield, you know, a special outcome, a special result. But these are both industries we were just talking about, that there's been multiple billion dollar roll ups by private equity, and they're still highly fragmented. And there's still people out there buying a bunch of them, putting them together, and then selling them up the, the, the PE pyramid. It's like, this is this is the way it works. Both of those companies contracted revenue, needs not wants, you know, low capital expenditures. You know, and if you compare, you know, how much capital it takes to build one of these service businesses to get to a million or $10 million in earnings, you know, or or 1 million and 10 million just in revenue, so much cheaper than 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 the amount of capital I'd have to find and deploy to to generate the same kind of cash flow in, in, in real estate. And so I think there's uh there's opportunities everywhere, but but entrepreneurs try too hard to try to come up with something new. I gotta have the new thing. No, you don't. You can go to boring old unsexy things and make a whole bunch of money. You know, that's that's the way the world works. And, and so it's understanding the game understanding what the attributes of a successful company, you know, and an industry to invest in look like, and then just focusing on that. Not everybody's successful, JT, in, in business, lots of people fail. The odds are stacked against you. And so that's why I try to lay out a roadmap that focuses people on, if you really want to improve the odds, if you want to stack the deck in your favor, these are the kind of attributes and the companies and the types of industries that you should be playing in because you have a higher probability of success and a higher probability of of climbing the pyramid and taking advantage of that thing called arbitrage. Well, if you want to do this with me and Adam, you can go to adamcoffee.com. The the link is also in the chat as well. And we appreciate if you can like and subscribe and share this and put your thoughts in your comments. Um, I want to point this at, and for everybody just listening, how no matter how much success you have, there's always people who will be doubting you, who will call you a scam, who will say you were lucky. And here's a guy like Adam um, that basically just, you know, in essence, wrote three best-selling topics, 2.6 billion in acquisition, 58 acquisition. It's not like some people teach out there. They had one exit, which is great, by the way. One exit made a hundred million on their exit, and all of a sudden they haven't done it again. And they just kind of lay off on that one exit. And so just to put this into perspective, right? It, it's 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 um I think there's a lesson here. Before the pandemic, everyone used to say, ah, JT's this, JT's that, JT's not real, JT's this guy, JT's a fraud. But during the pandemic, when you invest over $57 million cash of your own money into deals and people, like legitimately where people watch me live, put money in fund deals, right? And not like, like Shark Tank, where most of the deals don't get funded behind the scenes because, you know, people are going in there and they're doing a 30-minute pitch and they're leaving out all the, you know, because the sharks don't know, they haven't done due diligence, they don't know who's lying, right? It's not like they've been pre-vetted. 
and you realize that there's always someone trying to bring you down and whoever's, you know, uh, you know, whoever's trying to bring you down is below you. And you have to rise about that negativity and you just have to find that community who's going to get it. And if 51% of the people like you, you're going to be present in the United States. So most people don't like you, don't believe in you. So it works. Nothing is easy. You have to learn, put yourself with the, get the right information, have the right people around there, have the right systems in place um, and have, the 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 right type of capital right because some people it doesn't matter they have money that they understand and create that model that's sustainable predictable and consistent and adam and i are willing to possibly teach you to do this so we can do it together that is our only simple goal as well adam final thoughts before we end this as well and hopefully people like subscribe comment in there there's a link there as well but any final thoughts yeah, you can be a dreamer or you can be a doer. Get off your ass, get in the game. This is how it's played. Look forward to seeing everybody out there. Strongly recommend people also listen to episode um, number two and one. They're very good. Can you make nine figures doing this as well? And Adam will say, yeah, you can make 10. I just proved it. So that could be the maybe the next episode. And maybe our next show, we're going to go through a deal step by step um and evaluate the, that process as well so make sure you like subscribe and get notified we'll see you next time